Welcome back to Following Noah on the Stormlight Podcast. This week is episode 67, and we're doing chapters 41 through 44 of Oathbringer. Paul, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to to go through our chapters today. Good. Elliot? I think I'm, I'm still feeling a little overwhelmed from last week's dump of, of information, still trying to process what what we've been through but a little little lighter episode this time i think so we'll have a chance to maybe uh wrap our minds around where we're at in roshar yeah quite a bit a maybe quite a bit better yeah, yes. uh, digestible content this uh this episode we've got some odds and ends to to touch base on here a couple of characters we haven't heard of it or heard from in a while so uh without further ado elliot your two words for this episode my two words for this set of chapters is unexpected obstacles. Unexpected obstacles. And Paul? My two words this week are very deep. Um, but I would promise I'll explain. I have sad boys. All right. Unexpected obstacles and sad boys. Let's use these four words and talk about Oathbringer. All right, which boys and why are they sad, Paul? Well, all of our chapters, basically, except for the Shalon chapter, were about just boys, you know? <laughs> we had a lot of boys that came up, uh, a lot of boys we haven't seen or heard from in a while. We have a Teft chapter and a Moash um, chapter and, and all this stuff. And there was also a lot of sad things, specifically with the Teft chapter. It was very emotional and and sad there so sad boys hey, that's how we're summing it up okay elliot i had unexpected obstacles because in these set of chapters sad is a good word for it that there's there's a number of things that jump up that our characters were not expecting or at least i was not expecting our characters to have to deal with the the main one being teft uh this addiction, drug addiction, seems like a very logical explanation of the struggles we've seen Teft go through. But for some reason, I was not thinking that that's where that was going. And so that was very unexpected for me. And then we get a very unexpected cameo with Lyft, who is proving to be a little bit of an obstacle in our uh, our plot line here. And then Moash gets to deal with some unexpected uh, obstacles in his journey there. And then lastly, a little bit with, with Shalon and Renarin and, and Dalinar, a little bit of unexpected there, just in the fact that I, it's a little unexpected for me that Renarin seems to perhaps be embracing maybe the more scholarly pursuits that a lot of our characters have been kind of encouraging him to. And so I actually like the fact that we get to see that a little bit, but it was a little bit unexpected for me. So hence the words. Gotcha. I just wanted to jump right into this Teft chapter, and I'm going to preface preface this chapter by saying that Teft is one of my favorite characters. I, from what I've, all the context that I've read, including, including Rhythm of War, Teft is top five characters in the entire Cosmere for me. Wow. And so this chapter, when he gets his, um, his spotlight here in Oathbringer, and you get some better context of what he goes through of on a day-to-day -day basis i really um it's it's it tears me up to watch to watch Tef go through something like this and i wanted to hear your guys' thoughts on it before i uh, maybe get on a soapbox here but go ahead so for me this is it is very sad i i was very eager and excited whenever it starts, this chapter starts, and we see Teft for the first time in forever. I was like, okay, great. We've talked about this. Where's Teft? We haven't seen this man in a while. Um, and then it really, we see him at just the lowest point. You can see a man 
outside of her like bridge crew days, just just like a a leisurely situation, right? Where he's just like hooked on drugs and he's just a slave to them, where to the point of like selling his bridge four coat, even um, and just all this stuff. So it's very like heart wrenching and very sad to see, um, but it also is. Honestly, a, an impactful starting point to how we move forward. So, yeah, heart heart wrenching chapter, difficult one to to read here for very different reasons than some of the previous difficult chapters we've had. You, you're my my heart just reaches out to to Teft. I just want to you know give him a hug and and help him, which, which is exactly what. Te- or uh, Kaladin and, and Rock do basically. So props props to them for you know coming and getting him out of this situation. But the the chapter even ends on a downer of he's out, but he's not out. He he knows he's still in the rut. He knows he's still under the the control of this of this addiction. So yeah, painful stuff. Perhaps we should make a list of the characters in our story who most need a hug, like one yeah. through five. <laughs> who needs a, the biggest hug the most, you know? Talon L. be on that list, Tut. yeah. Would, I would put I would put Talon L. Lynn number one. Yep. Um, he's got a bit of an edge over Tuft uh, due to seniority, so. I think Zeth's um, on that list, too. I agree. Zeth needs I, a hug. Zeth needs a hug, I agree. I yeah. don't think Zeth would like a hug. I mean, the other guys no, would... But he needs it anyway. <laughs> he does need... It wasn't, does he want a hug? I don't think no. Teft would really want a hug. Either. Like He doesn't seem like a hugger, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I could see Talonel being a hugger, but... um, But yes, do they need a hug? Yes, Zeth needs a hug. Gotcha. I think a lot of our characters could go on that list. <laughs> <laughs> Kaladin certainly needs a hug. I mean, he don't. He needs a hug. Yeah, that's true. I think Renarin needs a hug. <laughs> Elliot agrees. Elliot, are you still here? I think Venley needs a hug too. That's true. Vinley does need a hug. I think the most I've ever wanted to give someone a hug in our story it was actually reading Warbreaker and uh, what's her face? Not not the name starting with a V. Siri? But I don't know. Yes, Siri. Siri needed a hug at the start of the book. <laughs> Lyft so, definitely doesn't want a hug, but I think Lyft one needs a hug. You know, L- Lyft needs a spanking. As, as <laughs> Lyft needs a timeout. <laughs> Lyft, Lyft does. Lyft needs some. This one there and a hug. She also needs a hug. Yeah. So, Trevor, before you you talk about this chapter, because I can tell it's a it's one that means something to you. A quick question about fire moss. Yeah, we we've seen fire moss before. As far back as Way of Kings, early Way I of Kings too. Yeah, I remember. I remember reading about it super early and writing down something. You know, hey, what is this? They rub it between their their fingers and get a little bit of a hit from it. But I, I did not connect this fire moss to like life wrecking drug. It seemed much more of a lighter substance, if you will, mm-hmm. and. Maybe it maybe it still is. There's kind of a hint in this chapter of like Teft's, you know, seems to imply that maybe other people can use fire moss and not, you know, get so addicted to it, but he's maybe just one of those people that has a weakness for this kind of thing. Am I on the right track there, or is this yeah. you know different than what I'm thinking? Okay. No, you that's you're, how I've thought of it. You're correct in that it in it of itself isn't super destructive. It's um it's not illegal, as they say in this chapter, where um kaladin tries to get them in trouble for having this little tent set up where you can come and burn fire moss but um it certainly can be addictive it's it's on the same lines as drinking or smoking where 
Like okay. it, it's not like super destructive, but if you, you know, if you don't have limits for yourself, then it can certainly consume your life as Got it does it. for Teft here. Um, there's a specific thing that happens in this chapter that I don't want to gloss over where Teft sells his military coat for fire moss. And that is like in any classic military setting would not be like, I mean, you'd probably be court-martialed, right? For, for destroying your, your uniform or um, not showing up to, like to the barracks without, without your uniform and saying you've, you don't have it anymore. So that is not a, a small detail here that he, he is so far gone to where he's willing to sell his bridge four uniform has the bridge four insignia on it. It represents Dalinar and Kaladin and everything they've gone through. And he sells it for one more pot of, uh, of fire moss. So, that's true. Uh, it shows how far, how far down this road he's gone. Um, I know that Brandon Sanderson, as a writer, like we talked about with, you gave a whole spiel about G Force and his like research it's... with like pilots and things like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's done his research on, and most people would probably understand that like drug addiction is something very different where people don't really value other things other than the drug that they want and so it's not i guess too far-fetched to me that this would happen um but it is like it shows the the depth that it had gone because this is probably like one of the most personal i like possessions he had and most important possessions he had that he got rid of completely agree and the the symbolism of it is is powerful just the the people, the the men of Bridge Four, like Bridge Four, that's their identity. They've been through such a crucible and come out of it with this reforged identity of we are Bridge Four, and they've just claimed that. And here's Teft going and selling his custom Bridge Four badge for the drug. Like just that, the meaning behind that is sad. Yeah, and couple couple more details of this of this chapter that teft has spoken oaths teft has a spren his own individual spren like he is not a a squire of the wind runners where he's being pushed through the motions by kaladin and like this is the first um ideal and this is how you like in theory how you breathe in stormlight no he has his own spren and he said ideals according to the spren um and so like he's a decent ways along um as far as we know of this knight's radiant thing and he's letting or in his mind he's letting her down he's letting himself down he's letting his bridge four buddies down so Yeah, I, I don't. I didn't know what to think about this. Like, how long has this been a thing? Has this been always, like, right. ever since we've met Te Teft? Or has this happened along the way, or what? Because so Teft was the one to first realize that Kaladin was surge binding, or or at least absorbing Stormlight. Right. right. He finds him after the high storm he was strung up, and it would make so much sense to me that he could recognize that because maybe he, you know. It probably wasn't on other people's minds in the slightest. Um, but if he had a spread of his own or understood that, that would make sense. But it, there's just a lot of missing pieces there. I would like to know more of Tef's story still to figure out how long he's had a sprint or what that has been like. Or has he ever really used his surge binding powers? Or And what order is he? Like, yeah. it's... Maybe assume that he's a windrunner because his spren is described as a small female person, I think, is all we really get. I think you get like a, a color too. Like, isn't she like clear and translucent too? Like, yeah, it's something I think like so. that. Yeah. And that all seems to fit with descriptions we've seen of, of Syl. So 
perhaps it's an honor sprint and he's a wind runner, but maybe not for sure wind runner. So I agree. Lots of questions here. And then Kaladin and rock come into this tent. They've like rock rock knows where he is. Um, I'm, I'm fairly certain as how they find him. Cause, um, in previous bridge four chapters in rocks chapter and six Hills chapter rock has an offhand comment of yeah tef still isn't here kaladin's just now noticing like rock knows what's going on and sigzel knows what's going on and so they come and pull him out of this tent and you know help him walk him back walk him back to the barracks and they make him promise that they will that he will let them help him and so there is there is that but i mean it's not super like uplifting this is still a pretty heavy chapter and then the somebody said this earlier i think it was you elliot the chapter ends with this super heavy note of teft is he realizes to himself that the thing he's most disappointed in he's he's super disappointed in himself he's super disappointed in letting down bridge four letting down his spren but the thing he's most torn up about is he's going to be watched for a couple days and he won't get fire moss for the next couple days that's the thing that's he realizes is the most upsetting thing for him right at this point at this moment right now so he is certainly not over this by any means he's certainly not even on the upward swing by any means <laughs> he's very much in the in the in the depths right now so yep feel bad for him want to give him a hug and just being honest hearing your perspective about it trevor gives me a lot of hope um for honestly of tech just being a more major scale character with a lot of our bridgemen i've which we haven't seen a lot of pers- like POV chapters or perspective chapters from our other bridge members. Um, but I'd kind of discounted them as like, okay, they're really cool. We have a distinct personality for each of them. But I didn't know how much further that would go. Um, and I thought the same here with Teft of like, okay, we're going to see this development of he's in a low place and he's brought back and kind of redeemed to be back in bridge four um but i didn't know if it would really go much further than that and i I would like to see it go further and honestly hearing your perspective gives me some more hope that that it would just go well and and we'll see more from teft and hopefully our other bridge members as well bridge four members anything else for 41 All right, 42. We are back in the same vision that we talked for 45 minutes on last week <laughs> and a couple, little different context, but still the same vision. And Dalinar is bringing Yanagon into this vision or Gox as we know him from Lyft's nickname of him. And uh, there's a couple interesting things that happen in this chapter, but uh, I want to push it over to you guys first before I highlight a couple things. So what did you guys get from this chapter? Well, I am thrilled to be back in this vision. Uh, this may be one of my highlights that we've read so far. We've actually covered a lot of really crazy stuff. We've seen it unmade, and this vision has been a whole... It could probably be its own little sub-book of its own, honestly. Like, um, There's so much stuff. And so we see... Yezrian, or Yezeriza, I don't know, there's lots of different versions of our Herald's names. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, which isn't that important, but don't they say his name is like Yezeriza Elin? Ye- I, pr- I know at some point it's said with an Elin at the end. So here's... And I was like... Uh, here's the uh, the lore. His name is Yezrian. But the Voran Church takes that name and makes it more palindrome-esque to match their 
their doctrine of palindromes equal holy. So they take Yezrian, they change it to Yezereza, which is more of a palindrome. It's not perfect, but it's it's closer. And then Elin is a title. So we've heard Talenalot Elin or Talenel Elin. Um, that's a title. That's a that's herald basically, um, more mm-hmm. like you know saint or who whatever you want to say there. I see. That that's basically what I was assuming. But that was the first time that I had really heard that or seen that or at least noticed it. I don't know if we've seen it before. Uh, but that was the first time that it made sense to me that I guess they have a title for them. Uh, because I've always heard Talenalati Lin, and I assume that was just his name. Like, that's just part of his name, the Elin. Um, so that was neat. Not, not That's just a little note. Um, but I have was really excited to see Yezrian, because from what I can tell, he's kind of our, like, primary... Our, our like, primary... Uh, Harold, um, kind of the leader of the bunch. And so I was really excited, but I don't know that I fully drew all the significance from it. And so that's where I'm going to hand it off to Elliot because I know he got all of the significance that needed to be... Um, every drop. Yeah, every single drop of significance that's supposed to be portrayed in this chapter, he picked up on, so... Yeah, if, if only... Um... <laughs> I I did not pick up that up about the Elin on the end of the name, so that is actually really interesting and helpful. I totally missed that that was on his name, so I'm really glad you caught that. The thing I noticed here in this chapter with Yezrian is for a moment, Dalinar seems like he recognizes him. He like pauses for a second, it's like, wait, he seems kind of familiar, which... On one hand, could maybe perhaps be this dude's famous, right? There's got to be maybe like paintings of him or murals or statues of him. Or has Dalinar met him before? We get the revelation, I think technically in in the last set of chapters, that they're still around. All the heralds are just out there doing their thing. They're apparently immortal and they're just chilling. So has Dalinar encountered Yezrian before, perhaps under a different name, perhaps in a scene that we've seen, perhaps? Like, that was my big question of, uh, maybe this isn't super important that Dalinar just, you know, oh, he looks kind of familiar. But on the other hand, maybe this is really important. Yeah. I agree. I think it's I think it's a lot more important than my Elin point, just to be <laughs> honest. Like, like if we have run into our herald before, like there could be a lot of significance there that we're we've since glanced over. And um if you recall last episode when we were talking about this um this vision, you remember that Novani caught a Fabriel um at a, on a knight's radiant and ran over and could like, hey, show me that Fabriel. Think about the context of this vision. This is the final desolation. And this desolation comes not even a year past the previous one. So we know that after each desolation, society and culture as a whole is kind of is decimated. Like it sets humanity back so many years each time it comes and they they realized they needed to do something or else humanity was going to like the void bringers were going to win. So is the, is that less than a year enough time to found their Knights radiant again? Or was that a Herald that she was talking to? Do you, see, do you see what I'm saying? Was there enough time to have like Knights Radiant on the battlefield? Or is the Stone Ward they see a herald? Is that Fabriel using Knights Radiant over there a herald? Like we all we know they're all there to put their to put their sword down at the end of the battle. So the Ezrian's cameo here isn't super unexpected because we know he's here based on the prologue or the prelude, sorry. So if they make that revelation of wait a minute, couldn't we, couldn't we show up to this battle and go find all the heralds like right now because we know they're all here? I 
I get the impression from perhaps the prelude and this vision that it seems implied there's more. No, they do talk about it. So the the heralds talk about the fact that they're leaving, but it's okay. The, there's still the Knights Radiant to protect the people. Correct. So they do talk about it. So that tells me that there are other radiants out there somehow. They've either been founded within a year or they, they survived the desolation. So I think there's other radiants out there. However, I really like what you're hinting at of Navani, Dalinar, and company scouring this vision to, to try and learn more about the Heralds so that they can go find them. We talked last time about how their plan is to go find the Heralds. Now, whether they're going to ask for help from the Heralds or try and kill them, that's the dilemma perhaps they're facing. But I still think you know, going to find them is kind of the next step for them. This could be really valuable if they could meet a few of them in this vision and say, okay, this is who we're looking for. Because without that, perhaps they have no idea what they're looking for. Correct. Just a little food for thought there. We had another cameo. We potentially had a few other cameos. Yes. I, I want to drag Paul into one of these real quick. Paul, did you catch the Kremlings? So I saw this on the outline and I got really excited. <laughs> Just because, like I said, I've, I've always tried to keep note of all of our Kremling sightings. I will be honest, I did not catch this one. So I'm curious to see. I don't know if you have the context in front of you or if you remember it well because i did not catch this on my read through i remember uh, it vaguely but I now i want to because i would very much I like to add this to my little kremlin collection you know yep okay here we go i i remember it vaguely but here i i flipped right to it so context here dalinar is just walking through the bat the battlefield right so there's a big battlefield there's bodies everywhere he realizes that there's Lots of different people. There's Shin, there's Alethi, there's Horn Eaters, there's Makabaki, lots of people. And then it says this. One spot they passed had a whole heap of strange Kremlings, burned and smoking. Who would have taken the time to pile up a thousand little crustaceans? If you blink, you miss it. But I didn't blink. I saw it, and I thought... He's seeing all these different you know, bodies on the battlefield. Is this pile of Kremlings another body on the battlefield? Because we've seen an entity before made up of oh, thousands of little Kremlings. Is this another one? It's Did it fight? Be. Right? Did it fight in this battle? Did, did it die here on this battlefield and this is what's left? The pile of Kremlings? Who's it fighting for? That's the second ah, question. That's what I was wondering. Why was it involved? Hmm. And if you're listening to this and you're completely confused, what we're referencing is not in Oathbringer or Words of Radiance. It's in Edge Dancer. Edge Dancer. So if you haven't read that, you better get over there and read that because it's important. Mm -hmm. But this could be another Mr. Kremlin man. It very well could be. In fact, like this this seems like more solid evidence even than the other sightings, which the other sightings were kind of ominous, creepy, whatever, ooh, Kremlings, right. and there's like a skeleton nearby or something I don't know, something like that. Um But this is more like direct it just basically seems like the corpse of a sleepless that's what they're called, right? The sleepless. No, we um, changed the names to Mr. Crumbling Man. That's what we. Yes, <laughs> yeah, this that's... is a Mr. Crumbling Man. This is what remains of a Mr. Crumbling Man. Um, or who knows? Brandon Sanderson needs to get on that and just add it to the book officially. Make that official. Yeah. Or yeah. who knows? Maybe Lyft was just bored and was stacking a bunch of dead Kremlings for a few hours before she makes her cameo coming up here in a second. Maybe. Uh, what's his name? Non Balat. Maybe he was over there and was just pulling apart, <laughs> pulling apart crabs. What a throwback. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. <laughs> that was an unsettling interlude. <laughs> throwback to Way of Kings. Um, but I did not catch that. I am, I am excited. I'm adding that to my little 
note of, of yep. Krimling's scene throughout the book here. Um, but yeah, but that was that, a, that that was a minor one. Couple sentences. The bigger cameo is Lift, right? Mm-hmm. She comes popping in out of nowhere, which again it was completely unexpected for me. Like, hold on a second. How is she doing this? We're in a vision, which, as far as we know, is completely controlled by the Stormfather, and Lift shows up clearly against the will of the Stormfather. The Stormfather's all like upset about it. How how in the world is she doing this? If you think about this in the context of not a deep dive podcast, if you skipped Edge Dancer, this is the first time you see Lift on page. Like you haven't seen Lift it was in the interlude. Uh, other than the, yeah. the words Radiance interlude. So like you just this is completely out of the blue, especially if you haven't read Edge Dancer, you're like, wait what <laughs> yeah. hello yeah. and that's what yeah. the storm father does too he's like wait a minute hold on like that's not allowed how could the Why are you here yeah how are you here i have so many questions yeah. the sense that i've gotten about lift's character is she just shows up in a lot of places she probably just shouldn't be and is just kind of always there like like sticking her nose and things you know and it's kind of funny because she just shows up and it's always like some impactful scene and she's like got any food or just i don't know <laughs> something something ridiculous like that am i am i remembering this wrong i i did i read this about two weeks ago is this where she has the comment about his butt mm, yep yeah oh, okay that's sense. right so she has an offhand comment to yawning on where He's like, yeah, you should trust this guy. He's got too nice a butt. And Dalinar's like, excuse me? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, classic lift. I, the questions that abound from this are, are many though. How does she even know that the Stormfather's doing this? How, how does she get into the vision? How does she take gox out of the vision like it's almost like she has more power than the storm father here and this doesn't make any sense the only reference the only hint we get here is the storm father says something about the night watcher and he calls her like child of the night watcher or something like that but it doesn't seem like the night watcher is doing this it's not like lift is like whoa now i'm in a vision and whoa now i'm not like the night watcher is pulling the strings it it seems like lift is pulling the strings so man mind blown she's Ooh. breaking all the rules right i'm trying to think of how how she can break these rules and there's another big rule we've seen broken in that like she can have some physical contact with when Dole, or mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Sprint, right? Yep. Um, and so I'm wondering, is Windle just cultivation, or that we've talked about? <laughs> is <Whoa>. is <laughs> is Windle this? Because it has to be some kind of like greater, Whoa. greater spread or something, right? Or greater, like something more powerful than just your Silfrena, right? You know. Um, so that makes me concerned. And the only thing that makes sense in my mind is the sprint she's with which is Wendell which when from seeing reading Edge Dancer and, and learning a bit about Wendell it doesn't seem like cultivation like you know like he's the one in charge but but I don't know what else it could be unless unless there is some crazy like Night Watcher experience in the past or something that like, because we talked about like she metabolizes, she literally metabolizes stormlight. Like she eats right. food and it becomes stormlight, which she uses to surge bind, which is very odd and different. So there's just a lot of weird and missing pieces with lift that don't make sense. And I'm, yep. I'll be honest, I'm scared we we won't really get definite answers. We need we need more lift POV chapters, which I think we'll get. But I, again, it's the we have a lot of problems on our hand, and I don't know if that is one that will be answered right now. <laughs> you know. All right. So, 
I'm going to answer all your questions right now. So Honor Perfect. has the high storm, comes from east to west, right? And Odium has the Everstorm, comes from west to east. And now you've got a third version where it's like Lyft is the Night Watcher version and she can just do whatever the heck she wants. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Trevor. No problem. Thank you so much. What would we do without you? Where would we be? Honestly, we'd probably be, but like you'd be done, done with, with the series. series. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lift seems like the anomaly to all the rules, apparently, and not not including Hoyd either. True. Like, if Hoyd were to just show up in this vision, it would make a lot of sense in my mind for no reason, but it would make sense. I'd be like, yeah, this it's, has been a... It's just it's a Hoyd, just thing. Hoyd. Like, yeah. that's the answer to the question is, it is Hoyd. Um, you know, so... Any other takeaways from 42? I think Ezrin is pretty cool. I'm really hoping, I'm really hoping that Yezrian is going to turn out to be someone we know. Like, it, this doesn't quite make sense because... Aladdin's if, father. Or, or like, you know, Gavilar or something like that. But but if that were the case, Dalmar would, would see him and, and, like, recognize him immediately, right? Like, oh, wow, you're this person. Paul so it's got to be something, something else. I heard yeah. you too. I'm just ignoring you. <laughs> the, Good man. I, I really want it to be someone we know i don't know if that's going to be true but i hope so all right and we already we already established who zile is he's a uh, vasher couldn't he or, be both or kelsier okay true two. or all three very true kelsier i like the who kelsier no, kelsier is. kelsier is kaladin sorry <laughs> Anyways. All right. 43. Uh, Graves and Moash are running away. Graves gets his head chopped off. That's about it. Anything else? Nope. That's all. <laughs> summed it up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was kind of surprised to see more from Moash. A bit. I say that, so we had a lot of... Moish has become more significant than I expected as well, like a lot of our Bridge 4 characters, but um, I viewed the end of Words of Radiance as Moash's like, pinnacle, because that was the, the key conflict between him and Kaladin and like what was right, what was wrong there. Um, I didn't know what to make of all of this. This does seem like almost an intro to making Moash a more pivotal character. Like this is a this is a POV point of view from Moash. I don't think we've had that before. And so this is I don't this almost feels like an entry moment of oh yeah, and this guy who you thought had just ex exited the stage, he's going to be a lot more important going forward. Something I'm just thinking of as well is we have now seen we've had a point of view chapter of basically all of our major bridgemen we we've had rock we've had sigzel right mm -hmm. we've had yep. teft now we have moash i don't remember if we've had we've had a bit of lopen point of view but not like a chapter dedicated to it i think the only lopen point of view you've had is the end of words of radiance where he's stashing mm -hmm. the king Yes. I forgot about that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I remember I remember him sucking in Stormlight. I forget he was it was only it was only a couple yeah. pages though. Yeah. That one was pretty yeah. short. Yeah. Um but I I'm just wondering like are we going to go through them all or are we going to keep getting these point of view chapters from each of them? Are they going to grow into like a more full character? I I would put them like are they going to come into the kind of category i'd think of like adolin maybe that's not like kaladin shallan but kind of that or dalinar but like that under tier i right. guess um the b tier 
Mm-hmm. The B team. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Are we going to keep seeing more? Are we going to, I don't know, but I, I wasn't expecting it to be honest. I thought, I felt like the characters were pretty well, like fleshed out where they were. I didn't know we would keep going with them and, and seeing more from their perspective, which I think is really cool. And I would like to see more. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly wasn't expecting it or to go through all of them. There were some that were kind of ominous, like, okay, Rock has all this, like, history or things with Spren that could be significant. Um, but I wasn't expecting it with, like, Moash. Um, so. On the flip side, I thought Graves was going to be a character we were going to revisit. I thought he was going to be, you know, oh, he's actually Teravangian's second in command with the whole diagram thing. And, oh, no, he's just dead. Oh, he's, yeah, okay. he's, he's dead. Got it. Okay, moving on. There there were two things, actually, that I pulled out of this chapter that I thought were important. I'm sure there's way more, but the two that kind of stood out to me were Moash notices a couple things. He notices a few things, but the two that he noticed that stood out to me were he notices that the Voidbringers don't heal. He specifically thinks about how hey, if I had stabbed Kaladin like that, Kaladin would have healed immediately. And these Voidbringers, who seem to have very similar powers to Kaladin, they're wielding, I'll call it dark light, for lack of a better term. They've got the dark stormlight, whatever. They're wielding their dark light in a similar fashion, but it looks like it may not allow them to heal, which could be important. And then the second thing I noticed is that Moash gets a little caught up on the fact that they, the Voidbringers are... Like it's almost like they're coming for the shard plate and shard blades that they have. Like that's what they're right. trying to get a hold of. And they fly off with the shard plate. But Moash is wondering, why didn't they lash it? They can fly, right? They can use the lashing surge bindings. Why don't they just lash the shard plate? But they don't. They like tie ropes to it and they drag it away manually. So do they either not know how to do that? Are they not able to lash other things and they can only lash themselves? Or is shard plate not lashable? Have we seen an instance in like a battles we've been in before where shard plate was like lashed like that? I don't remember. All right. So you actually have seen this before. Pretty recently, actually, where Dalinar is in the vision with what's her face brings her into the um yeah the midnight essence and he talks to his radiant buddy and he's like oh my helmet doesn't work or something like that just to kind of prod him to see if he can get information and he turns around to him he's like you're not even wearing your armor i couldn't lash you with it on got it i'm trying to think back to i need to go reread there was a zeth chapter where he slaughtered a whole bunch of men it's one of the early zeth interludes we got it was help me here he fights like two shard bears at the same time yeah remember this i do yes does he ever lash those shard bears in that battle that would be an interesting question that is a great question i'm gonna go reread that when we're done recording it's the uh it's the one where he's taking out all the Yakov at uh, yes. like High Council. And there's like three shard bearers there. Yeah. So that perhaps we may have just learned that shard plate is immune to that power. Maybe. Could be useful. That was it from that chapter, really. You, you had an offhand comment of the Voidbringers are after Shardplate, and they this is not the first time we've seen them do this. In the Esh, or in the Leshwi, Leshwi, in the Eshenai, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the Eshenai and Venli point of view chapter, they're after Eshenai's body for the Shardplate and the Shardblade. Like, they're specifically yeah. trying to go collect everything they know of. They chase down... Um, they chase down Moash and Graves to get their shard plate. Um, that's pretty, like that's why they're there. So, 
and letting Moash live is a, an afterthought. They kill, or uh, Moash kills that first Voidbringer, and the other three, they're not mad. <laughs> they're, they, you know, they don't seek vengeance on him or anything. Kind of just look at him like, yo, that was kind of cool. You want to come? He's like, sure. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so. Yep. Interesting. Interesting tidbits there. I've been thinking basically my, my biggest thought about that. I've been thinking about this whole like is Shardblade Lashable or all this stuff and we don't no, no, right now. Maybe we could figure that out if you really, really read stuff or, or search into it. But I've just always been under the assumption that you can't... Just because I feel shard blades and shard plates, as far as I understand, is from like the same realm or power level as lashings. And so I kind of assume that you can't. That's it. <laughs> that is all. Um... I've just been under the assumption that you can't or that that wouldn't be possible. Because if so, then I feel like shard plate would just be a big target or hindrance. Like, sure. like if you were a surge binder, you wouldn't want to use shard plates because that would hold you we, back. I do recall that we know that shard plate was like specifically designed to fight void bringers, right? So it's it's specifically built to fight go up against these types of power so it would make a lot of sense actually if it somehow is immune to surge bindings yeah adolin has a an offhand comment in the in the battle of narak where there's a bunch of red lightning flying everywhere and just bounces right off his armor and he's like oh, yeah that's kind of cool cool stuff i need to get me a set one of the first things you said when you met a uh, when you met a shard bear. I remember you're like, "All right, where's my set?" I still want. I still want a set. Yeah, you just go to the shard place store. Oh yeah. Obviously, come on. All right, chapter forty four. Uh, a character we haven't even mentioned. She showed up last episode. We went long and forgot to forgot to bring her up. But um, Ishna is this young and upcoming spy who has been spying on Vale and her her soldiers or Shalon soldiers and Vale find or uncovers Ishna and says, Yo, what the heck are you doing here? Well this is the second time I've seen you here. And Ishna's like, yo, I'm a spy, let me help you. Or let me work for you or whatever. Let me be in the ghost bloods. And Shalon's like cool all right uh teach my guys and you can hang around she's trying to pick up as much as she can from ishna but ishna doesn't know that um what were you guys' thoughts on 44 so this gave me a bit of concern it's it's you can chalk it up to just my concern for shalon with her multiple characters um she even talks about like oh shalon does this veil is more brash uh radiant just wants to practice her swordsmanship and hang out with adolin i don't know just like i feel like she's just going deeper into this three personalities thing in yep. in a bad way that i've been worried about since this has begun um it well so any veil moment i get nervous and worried there's a there's a specific line in here actually that's a little bit more alarming than than that it's uh wait i should she's in she's in the uh meeting of the scholars and she's thinking to herself wait i should i should create a new persona to deal with this with this intense scholar situation uh, a persona that knows things and then she thinks to herself, wait, no, that's Shalon. Uh, I'm just going to use Shalon. I'm going to use that persona. She doesn't think about herself as Shalon anymore. She's putting on Shalon's persona to be in this scholarly meeting. So that that's a very, 
distinct switch in her mind of, okay, now I'm putting on Shalon's persona or I'm not having a persona on. There's a, there's a clear distinction there. Yeah. She, she's going to get lost in it all. I, she's going to get, she's not going to know who she is at some point here. She's going to get so tied up in trying to balance all of these different people that she's going to lose her identity. I, I think she is. I think she, this may be the first point where we can say she has, like Trevor was saying, like, like what he was mentioning. Cause it's like, okay, down the road, we may be able to be like, okay, yes, she's lost her identity. If this were to continue, if there isn't some form of turnaround, then this would probably be the first moment we'd point to and be like, this is where she was no longer referring to herself as Shalon um, and things like that. And, and I am very worried for our our darling girl here. Um, and I do want to... I'll defend her a little bit for a second. I, what, she's, what she is doing of kind of compartmentalizing her life is not necessarily a bad thing, in my opinion. I, I think it's something we all do to some, you know, element, to some level. Like, I go to work, and I become work Elliot, and I, I put on my let's get things done, let's let's do this, let's figure this out, my, my engineer brain. And then when I go home to my wife and kids, if I go to, you know, my family with engineer brain on, they're going to get pretty frustrated with me pretty fast. I have to kind of set that aside and, and put on, you know, dad and husband brain and, and kind of live that part of me. So there is an element of this that is actually rather effective of Shalon can kind of, I'm going to put this hat on now and, and think in my, you know, spy mode, or I'm going to think in scholar mode. I just think she's going down that path a little too far. I think she's, she's separating her, a little too much those different mentalities such that she's now starting to forget who she is and who she's not and it's it's confusing her so it's the whole idea is not terrible i think she's just taking it a little too far it's my own that's my personal it's, opinion on it i see it's kind of like blurred the lines between almost or so so i i I agree with what you said, and I think because we've seen it and or maybe just how I've been reading it, I've seen this in kind of a negative light of how this may be to an adverse effect. I have since not not thought about that in a normal or healthy sense, because you're right. Like everyone has has their different hats, you know, like depending on scenarios you're in or places you go or like work. It could be school, could be friends family like you know there's lots of different environments that we yep behave or act differently in um and that's totally normal and honestly a good thing um and i kind of i'd honestly forgotten about that and i've i focused i focused a lot i'm sure our viewers have realized i've been very mean to shalon especially <laughs> in this book even though in all of our books i've been mean to shalon um and i really don't mean to but it it has happened. Um, <laughs> you're you're not alone. And, uh, there are a lot of people who are very critical of Shalon for seemingly no reason. I, there's something about mm -hmm. the way she's written. I don't know if it's because of her chapters being used as world building in The Way of Kings. That's how you meet her, and she seems kind of boring at that point, and then you get to know her later. I don't know if that's why or if there's another reason, but you're not. you're certainly not alone, Paul. There's a lot of people who are super hard on Shalon for no reason. Like Asta. Yes. Speaking of being hard on people for no reason, Renarin gets a little bit of shtick getting made fun of crap for no reason in this chapter, which I thought was a little sad. I felt bad for him. He gets mocked by some light-eyed scholar who knows everything yanala is is her name and uh shalon tries to stick up for him and uh Renard really appreciates that so that's pretty cool 
I did actually really enjoy this scene for the Renarin aspect of it. We've we've seen Renarin struggle a few times now. He's talked to a few different people. He's talked to Adolin. He's talked to Rock, I think it was, for a little bit about, you know, who am I? What what am I doing? How do I figure this out? And a couple of different people have encouraged him to, you know, embrace the more like scholarly or mental side of what you're doing. Don't try don't force yourself to be a soldier just because you think Dalinar, your father, and your brother want you to be a soldier. And I think Renard even said at one point, I think this was to Rock, where he's saying, my father doesn't tell me he wants to be a soldier, but I just know he wants me to be. Like, that's what he expects me to be. This chapter shows a, a shift in that. Renard is actively now pursuing some of the more scholarly side. He's going to the meeting of the scholars to help you know figure out some of the strategy. And... Dalinar comes to support him, which I thought was super cool. Dalinar is so busy trying to solve the problems of the world, and he takes an hour out of his day to go sit in a meeting so that Renarin doesn't feel too awkward. Like, that right there is so cool. That's the Dalinar that I fell in love with back in Way of Kings. Like, that is so... just. It's honorable, but it's also just so fatherly. Like he's taking a moment just to take care of his kid. That's it was so cool. It was a really cool moment. And it like it doesn't even occur to Shalon until like the meeting's over of why Dalinar was there. And then she's like, Oh, that's really cool actually that Dalinar made a point to be here. So so I'm curious if this will continue with Renarin. Is he going to kind of set aside trying to become a warrior and fully pursue the whole scholar path, if you will? Or is he going to get frustrated with it? Is there going to be another, you know, turnaround for Renarin? Is he still kind of lost? Or is this the start of Renarin kind of finding what he actually enjoys doing, maybe? And you know for a fact that, well, we don't. But you can assume for a fact that Renard did not ask Dalinar to be there. You know, like, right. he, he wouldn't ask that at Dalinar. Dalinar's a busy guy, and he's not going to have time to go to a, you know, a scholar's meeting. But Dalinar made a point to be there, even though he was late, but that's okay. I thought it was kind of funny in, in that respect, Trevor. So, so Renard is at this meeting, and... Believe so. This is from Shalon's perspective, right? Uh-huh. And she makes a comment, I believe, of like, "Isn't it kind of?" I don't remember if it was her thinking it would be odd, or if she was worried about other people thinking it's odd that Renarin is here, because typically it's not like the place for the like high princes, right, or the quote warriors. Everybody else are men. Everybody else is women in this. Mm-hmm. In this yes, movie. and and so she's kind of worried that it's odd, and I think it's. It makes sense. It makes sense. That's how life has always been for them. But I just thought it was kind of funny whenever I was reading this of like, okay, you're facing this like desolation and like potentially the end of the world. And I just thought it was kind of funny that they were like thinking about that, which which isn't anything important. But it was really cool to see Dalinar come as well. And then she was like, oh, yeah, if Dalinar's here, like no one would question it or it wouldn't be weird or anything like that, which makes total sense. Um but initially, I was like, yeah, like, I, I get the acknowledgement, but it's kind of like a minor thing in comparison, I guess. Um, but yeah, I always get very excited for Renarin moments, and uh, it definitely, what, there was one line about him kind of mumbling to himself, and, and that's happened a couple times where he kind of says things and no one hears what he says and it gets it's gotten me very curious at this point of what's going on what's he saying that we we aren't hearing yeah, Renarin is turning into like the character that always seems to know what's actually happening and no one listens to him like he's he's the one that you know oh well yeah that's this and everyone oh Renarin don't be silly like no one no one notices him but he actually seems to have a lot of the answers. Anything else? 
think that was it on my end. A lot of names we haven't been talking about lately. Moesh, Teft, Lyft, Renarin. I do I do have one more thing. Yep. Um, kind of in this chapter is at the end, don't we get this like info drop of Fabriol Fabrioles are all part of one thing, right? It's not like separate Fabrioles or anything like that. Doesn't Yasna make a comment on that? And it's kind of a big information drop. I thought that was pretty fascinating or thought provoking. You're you're right. I forgot about that. They talk about I think it's is it Renarin actually that's yes. talking about or one of the scholars and then Renarin, yeah, like that's what Renarin is saying is he's saying that they're discovering these different fabrials in the city, but actually they're all one fabrial. Like it's all one interconnected system, which I'm glad you brought that up because that actually is part of what I was kind of guessing that that fabrial gem pillar might just be the that it is of some sort of basement. Yeah. Yes. That it is some sort of like power source for the entire city that it might run all of these different systems that, might be, you know, what we might think of as, you know, modern technology like plumbing and air conditioning and like all these different things. Maybe this Fabrio, this one system powers it all. That it did sound like that's perhaps exactly what it is. I'm glad you brought that up because I I remember when you initially made that comment and I was like, that seems like something that like why why would that be here, I guess. But seeing the kind of grander scheme of the city it does make sense. It logistically makes sense here. Um, and so I'm I'm really curious to see how these are all connected or why or And and how do they power it? As I think of me the question, because I think they even talk about how they've tried to imbue it with Stormlight and they can't. So is it well different? So they've talked about how they can't transfer Stormlight via a Knight's Radiant. Mm-hmm because a nice radiant could suck in stormlight and then emit it again because you can re-imbue a, a sphere but they can't do that with the pillar but also they're above the storms right so how do you how do you infuse your spheres if you're above the storms right they need like a 100 mile long lightning rod that they can stick down in the valley where the storm actually goes and then when the the storm goes by it hits their their 100 mile lightning rod and it all runs up that channel up into the up into your ether soft no they just need to make a 100 mile long lightning rod that shouldn't be too hard they can soul cast they can just like you know make a bunch of lumps of grass for 100 miles and then poof metal or rope yeah (laughs) I like the grass idea. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? I did like that you brought up the the dead Eurythiru theory again. That's a good point. You look nice today, Trevor. That is my final thought. Thank you. Do I look mm-hmm. as nice as my backdrop? No, nothing will ever look that good. Good looking backdrop. All right. With that, we will close this episode and reconvene next week. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot. See you next week. Bye-bye.